Let's pray as we stand. Father, as we come to your word, thank you that you promise to speak by your spirit through every part of your word. And so as we come to this final passage in the book of Haggai, as we read uh, some strange things, Lord, might you still speak to us? Might you encourage us? Might you reveal more of your character through this chapter? Might you help us to fix our eyes on Christ? We pray this in his name. Amen. Please take your seats. I wonder if you can remember a time in your life where things have turned in a slightly surprising direction. Ruth and I got on the subway in New York and we weren't 100% sure that we had got on the right train. A couple of helpful people reassured us that we indeed were heading towards where we wanted to go, but then things turned in a strange direction. One of the men sat across from us who had reassured us that we were heading in the right way said to me, you look weak. It was about 35 degrees Celsius outside, so I said, it's, it's hot, but I, I think I'm okay. He repeated what he had said, you look weak. What do you mean, I asked. You look weak, he replied. Now, in my head, I was trying to work out what he meant. Did I look unwell or did I look weak because I'd led my wife onto a train without knowing it was going the right way? But for the next five to ten minutes, which feels like a lifetime. I I grew gradually more awkward because the man sat across from me was now just chanting one word at me for the entire journey. Weak, weak, weak. This is our third and final week in the book of Haggai. And at the start of our passage, things turn in a surprising direction. The Israelites have been building God's temple for around three months. And though there have been setbacks, discouragements, as we saw last week... Uh, The work has continued and they've made some tangible progress. And you can imagine the people are starting to feel fairly good about themselves. Uh, They'd listened to Haggai's challenge in chapter 1, began to prioritise the building of the Lord's house ahead of their own, a, a great start. Then last week we saw that though they went through a bit of a discouraging patch in the first three weeks of the project, uh, they've persisted. Uh, Haggai's second sermon uh, of encouragement helped them through. Uh, And so now, around the three-month mark, they might be starting to think, things are going quite well. Uh, We're almost out of trouble. It it won't be long until God comes and dwells in this temple now, just just a bit longer, and we'll have fixed our broken relationship with him for good. But then we come to the opening verses of our passage, and things turn in a surprising direction, because we we, we suddenly start thinking about cleaning, about blessings for a defiled people, if you read the subheading. If you were to turn over the page and skim over Zechariah chapter 1, you'd see that God has sent another of his prophets, Zechariah, to call the people to turn from their evil ways just one month before this passage takes place. And this context suggests that though outwardly the people have been hard at work building God's temple, their hearts still remained far from the Lord, as evidenced by their evil deeds. And so at the start of our passage, we'll see Haggai reveal the people's problem runs much deeper than they realize. Uh, Though they've tried to put things right, there there are some problems that remain just as bad as they were before. Uh, Problems that just considering their ways or changing their actions can't fix. And yet, though our passage begins in a surprising and fairly hopeless place, uh, by the end of our passage, I hope we'll see that the Lord is still determined to bless his people. Uh, That though he exposes the reality of his people's situation, he does not leave them without hope. Instead, he makes incredible, rich promises of blessing. Because our God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Three points this morning. Our first, the people have a purity problem. Uh, In verse 10, we see that the word of the Lord comes to Haggai again, and he gives his third of four sermons. Uh, Although this one takes a slightly different shape. Uh, It comes in the form of some priestly CPD training. Look with me at verse 11 to 13 again. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius... 
the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. Uh, If someone carries consecrated meat in the fold of their garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, olive oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of those things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priest replied, it becomes defiled. Uh, Haggai gathers the priests together for a QA. Uh, and though the questions might not seem straightforward to us, these were basic multiple choice questions for them, questions that they would have covered in their Torah workshops when they were young. And Haggai's first question if a clean object touches an unclean object, does the unclean object become clean? No. All the priests correctly answer. Okay, how about question two? If an unclean person touches a clean object, does the clean object become unclean? Yes, the priests answer correctly again. Haggai's two questions are designed to illustrate that uncleanliness is contagious. Cleanliness isn't. Uh, Holiness is not contagious. But sin is That might still sound a bit religious and abstract to us today, but but we see it played out everywhere. Growing up, I had a beautiful golden retriever called Maisie. And like many a dog, when we took her out for a walk, her radar would lock on to the nearest muddy puddle where she would roll around in it, sit in it to her heart's content and look like this. Now, when we brought her home to our nice, clean house, what do you think would happen if we just led her straight in? Do you think our nice, clean house would transfer its clean state to her, making her clean? Or or do you think it's more likely that the dirt she had covered herself in would spread and contaminate the house, ruining the carpet and the sofa in the process? Or if you were to take someone who has COVID or a cold, put them in a room full of healthy people, would it be more likely that by being in the presence of some healthy people the sick person would become well, or would the sick person be more likely to spread their illness, infecting those around them? A couple of preachers have used the illustration of one bad apple spoiling the whole batch. Put one rotten apple in, a, in an apple cart with a bunch of good apples. You, you don't expect to come back in a week and find that rotten apple has become crisp and whole. You expect to come back and find that the whole cart has been ruined. Haggai's two questions to the priest here are designed to illustrate that cleanliness is not contagious. Uncleanliness is. Health is not contagious. Disease is. Holiness is not contagious. Impurity is. So why does Haggai ask these questions? What what is the point of these questions? Verse 14. Then Haggai said, So it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. You can imagine the silence in the room as Haggai drops that bombshell. At the temple building project that the people have begun to undertake was, was meant to help fix their broken relationship with God, but instead it's revealed the true scope of the people's purity problem. The people are unclean. And so all that they do spreads their uncleanliness. Uh, Even when they do a good thing, they they do that good thing with dirty hands. Uh, The people's hearts are unclean. Therefore, the works of their hands are unclean. And so like the grubby toddler who's managed to get more chocolate cake on their hands than in their mouth at dinner time, whatever they touch becomes unclean too. Every stone, every panel, every sacrifice they offer in the temple will be unclean because they are unclean. In fact, their impurity is so utter and complete that the Lord says whatever they do and whatever they offer there is defiled. Haggai is showing the people they cannot fix this situation themselves. No matter how much considering of ways goes on, no matter how much temple building they get behind, they cannot make themselves clean by the good things that they do. They can't fix their broken relationship with God because whatever they touch, 
whatever they do becomes impure. God is revealing the hopelessness of worldly religions that say you can work your way into God's good books by doing enough good things. He's shattering the illusion that we can clean ourselves up and make ourselves presentable before a holy God. Instead, he is showing his people they are unholy before a holy God. They are in desperate need of outside help. Just like the muddy retriever who needs their owner to wash them down. Just like the grubby toddler who needs their parent to step in and clean away their filth. So too the people need someone who is not contaminated with the same stuff as they are to step in and help. Someone who is able to make their hearts clean. Someone who can make the works of their hands presentable. Someone who can cleanse the temple, offer a sacrifice that would be acceptable before God. Like us today, the people needed Jesus. But until he came, the people were to keep building the temple. They were to keep offering sacrifices, even though they knew in and of themselves these things couldn't make them clean. But they were to offer them in faith because God had commanded them to. Uh, but this revelation should have helped them to see what the writer the, to the Hebrews says uh, at the start of Hebrews chapter 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, they would not have stopped, uh, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The sacrifices the people offered in the Old Testament, they, they were ultimately a reminder of their unclean state, rather than the cure for sin in and of themselves. But they were still necessary uh, their sacrifices offered in the temple were never able to take away their sin, but instead they were to be offered in faith, pointing forward to the day when God would bring true and lasting cleansing from sin through his Messiah, pointing them forward to that day of the Lord that we saw at the end of our chapter last week when God himself would come and turn this unclean temple into a temple filled with glory that could truly be bring about the peace that we saw promised. Three months in, this was a reminder to the people of their utter dependence on the Lord's kindness and grace, of their deep need for him to step in and bring them cleansing. But because the Lord is a kind and gracious God, point two, the Lord will bless the undeserving. I have to confess, uh, verse 15 to 19 are not the most straightforward verses I have read in Scripture. But Haggai seems to be getting his people to co compare and contrast what life was like before they started rebuilding the temple uh, to what they can expect life to look like now that the temple building project is in full flow. Uh, and so verse 15 to 17, Haggai is wanting, his, he's wanting the Lord's people to look back and consider what were things like before you turned to the Lord. Look with me at verse 15 to 17. Now give careful thought to this from this day on. Uh, consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Uh, Haggai makes... A very similar point to the one he made in chapter 1, but using different examples. The physical trouble in the promised land was a sign of the people's underlying spiritual trouble, like their sin, their purity problem. Uh, so in these verses, Haggai gets them to consider, when you came to a heap of 20 measures of grain, a big pile of grain, and you thought to yourselves, yeah, that, that's good enough for 20 packs of Weetabix, did you not question why that grain was actually only good for 10? When you thought that the number of grapes that you'd harvested looked good for 50 bottles of wine, did you not consider why it ended up only yielding 20 bottles? Again, as we saw in chapter 1, 
this had been God's. I struck all the work of your hands. Why? So that his people would wake up. So that instead of looking for security, certainty, and stability in themselves or in the material things of the world, they'd look for those things in the Lord's. That the people would stop walking down the path to destruction and might instead come back to the God who is determined to bless them. And yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord in verse 17. Their circumstances should have led them to remember passages like Deuteronomy chapter 28, where God had promised blessing to the Israelites in the promised land if they obeyed him and did what was right, but to curse them if they were sinful and disobeyed his word. Curses that spoke of poor harvests and blight and mildew, the things we see in Haggai chapter 2. The Lord's discipline should have been enough. That gut feeling of things aren't quite the way they should be was all the people needed to lead them home. But their hearts remained hard, and they did not return to the Lord. And yet God is so determined to bless his people, even when they don't deserve it. But he sent Haggai, his prophet, to spell things out. He sent his word to bring even greater clarity. Because of the Lord's persistence, his people responded in chapter 1, verse 12, with obedience and fear. They did turn, even if it was in part, from looking for security, certainty, stability in the wrong places. And instead, they returned to the Lord, demonstrating that by rebuilding the temple. And so now that the people have returned to the Lord, the temple building is underway again. After this 24th day of the ninth month, the times are going to change. Verse 18 to 19. From this day on, From this 24th day of the ninth month, give careful thought to the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now, the vine and the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on, I will bless you. Is there any seed left in the barn? No, is the implied answer. Because at this time of year, all the seed is in the soil. People have planted all of their crops for the next year. Their seed barns are empty. And so now all they can do is wait. Wait and see how the seed they've planted in the ground fares. And if the last few harvests have been anything to go by, next year's harvest, it it doesn't give the people much cause for optimism. All their key fruit-bearing trees. Did you know an olive is a fruit? Uh, The vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree, they, they haven't fared very well over the past few years. So why should they expect a different outcome in the year to come? Well, because they have a temple now. Or at least the beginning of one. Uh, That's what the compare and contrast in this section seems to be doing. Verse 15 to 17, think back to when you didn't have a temple. Things went badly. But verse 18 to 19, now that you have begun rebuilding the temple, now that my presence is with you, you can look forward to the future with optimism. From this day on, I will bless you. Though it still looked small and weak, The temple is the turning point for the people because it was a sign that God's presence was with them once again. The building of it demonstrated their faith in God, their faith in the temple that was to come. And so he promised, from this day on, I will bless you. Ian Dugweed writes, just as the reestablishment of the temple was the critical turning point for the people of Haggai's day, so the coming of Christ, the definitive temple of God, is the radical turning point from curse to blessing For the world, joy to the world, God is with us. With the coming of Christ into the world, now there is peace on earth among those on whom God's favour rests. Life without Christ does not lead to the blessed life. Instead, it is the road towards destruction and judgment. Sure, things might go well for a time, but ultimately it is a life that has no guarantee of certainty, security, or stability. But life with Christ guarantees new life, blessing. It guarantees ultimate security, 
certainty, stability in him. It's not a promise that everything in this life will go well. Certainly not that material or physical blessing are guaranteed. But instead, as we've seen in Haggai, it means the promise of God with us, of peace with our maker. Or as Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 3, every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ. Adoption to sonship, his glorious grace, the guarantee of redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That is the blessed life. And those blessings are forever ours if we are in Christ because he is our perfect, completed temple. And because we have a temple in Christ, God's presence can be with us and we can be blessed as Christ deserves and not as we deserve. This is who our God is. He is a God who is determined to bless his people even when they don't deserve it. That's why the gospel is such good news because Christ Jesus hasn't come to save some lovely, nice people who deserve to be saved. No, instead, Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners, the undeserving, to offer the truly blessed life to those who don't even deserve it. Our final point this morning, the Lord will build through the underdog. Whilst I was on that subway, with a man chanting in my face that I was weak, I wasn't quite sure what to do. Uh, It's amazing how weak you feel when someone is chanting the word weak in your face for five to ten minutes. I I felt awkward, uncomfortable. Uh, I was slightly worried for Ruth and for my own safety. Uh, But the one thought that brought me a degree of comfort was, I'm sure I'm going to be able to work this into a sermon one day. (laughs) Uh, The word of the Lord comes to Haggai a second time on the same day. And he gives his fourth and final sermon. And this final sermon in the book carries a very particular promise for Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. We thought a little bit over the past few weeks about how being governor of Judah might sound quite impressive. But in reality, it was a weak and small role as part of a much bigger, more powerful empire. Darius of Persia was the great king of the time. He could have sat opposite Zerubbabel and just said, you're weak, you're under my thumb. You're just the governor of a small province in a part of the world that is past its best. And you're only there because I allow you to be. And yet our great God very often makes big promises to those that seem small. He loves to lift and exalt the weak and the lowly because he's a God who loves to build through an underdog. Look with me at verse 20 to 23. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord. And I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. We saw last week that shaking in the Old Testament comes in reference to the day of the Lord, of a day when God will bring about perfect justice, new life for his people. Uh, Usually when you shake something, it, it, it results in chaos, Think of the devastation that an earthquake brings. But this shaking that the Lord promises in verse 21 and 22 will result in clarity and order. And we get more detail about the day of the Lord in these final verses of the book of Haggai. God promises to shake the heavens and the earth, shaking away all the other royal thrones that seem big, shattering foreign kingdoms that seem strong, using Exodus-like language to describe how he will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders. And once the shaking stops, when the great kings and the powerful armies have been toppled, on that day, little, weak Zerubbabel will remain. Not only will he remain, but God will make him like his signet ring, like the ring a king has on their hands to seal official letters with wax. That is an incredible promise to Zerubbabel. Being like a signet ring 
might not be a compliment we might use these days, but it was a, a sign of being treasured by God, of carrying his authority, of, of being close to him. It's an incredible promise to make, particularly to someone who seemed as small as the rubber bell did on this global stage. But this promise of God's to make Zerubbabel like his signet ring, it would have carried an even deeper significance for Zerubbabel because of his family history. In Jeremiah 22, verse 24, because of his sinfulness, God had said this of Zerubbabel's grandfather, Jehoiakim, just before sending him and the people into exile. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, even if you, Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were a signet ring on my hand, I would still tear you off. God had thrown Zerubbabel's grandfather Jehoiakim away in judgment because of the damage that he had done to his house. But because Zerubbabel had returned to the Lord and worked to build his house, God promised to exalt Zerubbabel by building up his house, his family line. At the time Zerubbabel lived, it would have been easy for him to be discouraged, to think that God had given up on him or with his family. And yet it is through Zerubbabel that the Lord says he will bring about his promises of redemption, his coming kingdom, his new creation. Uh, There are messianic echoes all over these final verses in Haggai. uh, Of 1 Samuel chapter 7 where God promises to build King David's house through his line to bring the promised Messiah who would save his people from their sin. And now he promises to do the same through Zerubbabel. Uh, or where God calls Zerubbabel his servant. It's a favorite messianic reference of the prophet Isaiah. And though it can be really tempting to skip or skim over genealogies in the Bible, in Matthew 1, where the apostle Matthew records the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, we read in Matthew 1, 12 and 13, that Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, is recorded as an ancestor of the Messiah an ancestor of Jesus. Though Zerubbabel looked weak, from his family line came the greatest king of all, the Messiah, the most precious son of the father, Jesus. Though Zerubbabel's kingdom was small, through him would come one whose kingdom would fill the heavens and the earth. In Zerubbabel we see a picture, a type of the true king who was to come. Mark Naren Covicius writes, when we read about Zerubbabel in the Old Testament, we're not just learning a dry history lesson. We're seeing a picture of God's story for mankind, our own story, which finds its climax in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the descendant of David, who brings back the rebellious exiles, who establishes the temple where the sacrifice is made to reconcile God and man, and who protects his people until the very end. He is our king our saviour, our mediator, and our shepherd. As we consider our ways at the end of the book of Haggai, we can look back and see that God keeps all of his promises to his people. That he kept his promises to his people by dealing with their purity problem. That in Christ, our God came to bless the undeserving. That through weak Zerubbabel, he he built through the underdog giving him the lofty privilege of being an ancestor of Christ, the true and forever king. And because the promise God made to Zerubbabel has been fulfilled, we can be confident that the Lord will keep all of his promises to us today, that God really does dwell with us by his spirit because of Christ, that we have peace with him because of Christ, that we have true and lasting cleansing from our sin because of Christ, that we can know the Lord's blessing because of Christ and that we can be certain, no matter how weak the church might look at times today, no matter how weak we might feel as we go out into the world, we can be certain that Jesus will build his church today because he has promised that even the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let me pray. Father, thank you that all of your promises 
are yes and amen in Christ. Thank you that you kept your promises to Zerubbabel. That even when he lived at a time of great discouragement, that even though he didn't always see your greater and bigger plan for the world, thank you that you kept your promises to him, that he is with you, that through him you brought Christ. And Father, thank you that because you have brought Christ, all of your promises to us, we can be certain of, that you will build your church, that we have forgiveness of sins in you, that we are part of your house. Father, help us to remember those promises as we go out into a week where sometimes it can be easy to forget them. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.